Jnana-chimidangasya Jnana-chimidangasya Chakshurna-vaitam jena Tasmai Shri Gurudena Mukham Paruti Vachalam Pangam Langayate Girim Yad Kripa Tamam Vandi Shri Gurum Dinatalam Manchakal Padru Mestra Kripa Sindhu Yevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo 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 Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayate Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namani Gaudati Seva He Krishna Karna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagat Pate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namo Vastute Tapta Kanchara Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhan Sute Devi Pranamami Vaidhi Vrindai Tosi Vibhai Triyai Keshavasya Chai Krishna Bhakti Pradevi Satya Vachai Namona Bhaktya Vihina Paradhi Vachai Shiddhashtra Kamari Taram Dhamadhi Kripamai Tvam Sharnam Dhabanya Vrinde Namaste Charnam Anchatadvatmakam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Svarupakam Bhakta Vataram Bhakta Kham Namam Shri Krishna Chaitanya Shukho Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vas Adi Gaurabhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare First of all I'm offering my unlimited dandana pranams and my Shraddha Bhushpanjali at the lotus feet of my beloved Guru Dev, Nitya Lila Pravishta, Om Vishnu Pad Asto Tarasata, Sri Srila Desi Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Maharaj, Srila Prabhupada. And then I'm offering my same unlimited Dandavat pranams and my Shraddha Bhushpanjali unto the lotus feet of my beloved Sikh Shraddha Devs, Nitya Lila Pravishta, Om Vishnu Pad. Ashtotarasata, Sri Srila Bhakti Rakshak, Sri Dhar Goswami Maharaj. And Nitya Lila Pravishta, Om Vishnu Pad, Ashtotarasata, Sri Srila Bhakti Vedanta, Narayana Goswami Maharaj. And Dhanada Pranama Sri Bodhisattva, Nitya Lila Pravishta, Om Vishnu Pad, Sri Srila Bhakti Vedanta, Vamana Goswami Maharaj. And to all of my Sri Sri Rupa Amida, Guru Bhargava, Dhammadat Pranams to all the Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis in this auspicious assembly uh, in Sri Jagannath Puri Kshetra Dham on the banks of the uh, Samudra and at Chakra Tirta by Dhammadat Pranams to all Vaishnavas. <coughs> So there's a number of um, 
verses and shlokas and so forth that are going through my mind that I've been contemplating and uh, I've been wanting to, to quote uh, and to read some parts uh, of the purport of these shlokas. So to begin with, I, I wanted to um, just touch upon something in the first chapter of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, the first chapter of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita is actually uh, beginning the great dissertation uh, on Sri Goranga Mahaprabhu and his associates. Uh, but first of all, the topic of Guru is being presented. In fact, the very first verse of Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is composed by Sri Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, he is offering his unlimited obeisances to uh, six different aspects uh, of the Supreme Absolute Truth, who is none other than Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So, there he begins by saying, Vande Gurun Isha Bhaktan Isham Isha Avatarka Tat Prakashamscha Tat Shakti Krishna Chaitanya Sangyatam. So, here he is mentioning, first of all, Vande Gurun is the first words. I offer my vandana, my prayers, <clears throat> my glorification to the, guru, the gurus uh, who have manifested in this world. But he uses the plural form, he doesn't use the singular form. He says gurun. Uh, that means all gurus. Why? Because this is a manifestation of the Supreme Absolute Truth. He is describing six different manifestations. And the first one is Sri Guru. Vande Gurun. Then the second one, Isha Bhaktiha. It means the Vaishnavas, the Bhaktas of the Supreme Lord, Isha, who is the Supreme Controller. Isha Bhakta. They are also included within the scope of the Absolute Truth, Absolute Reality, Isha Bhaktan. Then he uh, gives obeisances to the Supreme Lord himself, Isha, who is none other than the origin of all other incarnations. That means Bhagavan Sri Krishna, uh, Krishna's to Bhagavan Swayam, the original Supreme Lord from whom all other manifestations have come. Uh, then Isha Avatara coming. That means all the avatars who are, have expanded from him and who appear within the material cosmic manifestation and who also appear within the spiritual world. All of his expansions, of which he delineates later on that there are varieties, different types of expansions. Isha Avatara Kam. Then Tat Prakashams. So his manifestations, Prakash, Prakash Vigrahas. There are innumerable manifestations of the Supreme Lord uh, on different levels. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is also talking about uh, even within this material world, how he and his vibhutis, his powers, his potencies, they manifest within the material world uh, in the form of the sun, in the form of the moon, and in the form of uh, the great oceans, and in the form of all different manifestations that are extraordinary and superior. Whatever you find within the material world that is extraordinary and superior, Krishna said, that is manifestation of myself. So he says, of all fishes, I am the shark. Of the elephants, I am Ayravata, like this. So, 
But there is also the Prakash Vigraha manifestations of the Supreme Lord. Uh, and they take various forms within the material world. Uh, also, like the Shakti Avish avatars, Guna avatars, Vila avatars. So, Tabak Prakashams, and then the sixth, the sixth aspect of the Absolute Truth is Tat Shakti. The energy, the potency, the power of that Supreme Lord that is within the Absolute Truth. Uh, and the potency and the potent are also non-different, but yet at the same time different. Uh, to study this, to understand this, this is actually the main topic of the Vedanta Sutra that we've been hearing for these last couple of weeks. Uh, the, the difference and the non-difference between uh, the Supreme Absolute Truth and His expansions and His Shaktis and so forth. Because ultimately, they are all Him. How can they be other than Him? They've come from Him. Uh, they are Himself manifesting everywhere. If we study the four essential verses of Bhagavatam, which are also included in this first chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita, then we understand like that, that uh, everything that is existing is actually Himself. But yet, there is also a difference. Uh, so that difference and that oneness has to be understood properly. Uh, the Mayavadis uh, and the impersonalists, they only focus on the oneness. And therefore, the Mayavadis mistake the Absolute Truth as being their own self. I am that. Tattvam uh, asi. You are that. You are that Supreme. But that is not actually correct. In a certain way it's correct, but in a very uh, most important way it's very incorrect. Now, in the Vedas, in the Upanishads and so forth, there are many references, as we've learned, that uh, the living entities, uh, they have oneness with the Supreme Lord. And there are also many references that there is difference. But whenever there is a discussion of oneness and difference, it is always emphasized more the difference. And uh, therefore, if someone mistakes that because I am one in quality with the Supreme, uh, just like a spark of fire comes from the fire, so it is nothing other than the fire. Uh, but that spark is tiny and the fire is very great. So, this is the essential beginning understanding of approaching the Absolute Truth, is to first of all understand my very insignificant, finite position in relation to the infinite. And without comprehending that, one cannot begin the process of bhakti. You can even begin the process of bhakti. Uh, in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, of Sh uh, Srila Prabhupada wrote toward the beginning of his Krishna consciousness movement, he was, <coughs> he was giving various teachings from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, five different topics, discussions. And when he was discussing with the Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, who was posing as a Mayavadi here, uh, when Mahaprabhu was discussing with him, there were, Mahaprabhu clarified everything to him, and he defeated the conception of total advaita, oneness with the Supreme. He defeated that, and uh, and uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was converted. And later on, uh, he became such a Vaishnava, and he became so averse to hearing the word mukti that there was one shloka that he recited from Srimad Bhagavatam, wherein the Supreme Lord is called Muktipada, but he changed it. He changed it to Bhaktipade, because the, the word Mukti didn't 
feel good to him anymore <laughs> because he had been so much affected by that desire to become one with the Supreme. So therefore he replaced that word. That's in that Tatena uh, Kampam Susamikshama verse. So at the end it says, Jiveta yo mukti pade sadayapak. So he replaced it. And Mahaprabhu kind of laughed when he saw that change in Sarvapon Bhattacharya. So in that discussion and teachings of Lord Chaitanya, <coughs> Sri Prabhupada makes a comment there. And he says that Sri, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is none other than Krishna himself, with the mood and complexion of Srimati Radhika, golden color. He has descended to this world to bring all living entities to the very highest abode in the entire creation, the very highest place. Nothing, nothing higher than that. That is called Goloka Braj, Goloka Brindav. Not any other destination along the way. No Vaikuntha, no Dwarka, no Mathura, no Ayodhya, no... Only Goloka Braj. That is where he has come from, and that is where he has come to bring everyone to there. Very important to understand this. He has no other no other destination. And that is why in the Chaitanya Charitamrita it is told that Krishna, he cannot be attained by the bhakti which is weakened by the mood of Aishwarya. Why? How is it weakened? Aishwarya means that you understand he's the Supreme Lord. I'm, I'm his insignificant tiny little servant. Huh? And with awe and reverence, I'm worshipping him, uh, overwhelmed by this mood of his supreme grandeur and opulence and lordship over all. So that mood is called Aishwarya, Bhav. And in Vaikuntha, that mood develops into Aishwarya, praying in Vaikuntha. But in the beginning of Chaitanya Charitamrita, the fourth chapter, I believe, th third or fourth chapter, Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami is explaining there that Krishna, he does not become satisfied by that type of praying, which is mixed with Aishwari mood, you know, awe and reverence. And he said, it cannot satisfy me. Krishna himself is speaking. It cannot satisfy me. Uh, because it's weakened. What is the weakness? There is no intimacy. The extreme intensity of love that overwhelms the devotee and the devotee in his heart takes complete ownership and proprietorship of the Supreme Lord. He is mine. He is mine. Now that Mamata is there even in Vaikuntha. He is our Lord. But it is not as deep and intimate as the affection of the residents of Goloka. And this is a very, very important thing to understand for those who come into the movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because he did not come to give that ring. Why? Gurudev told many times that there have been many acharyas that have appeared within this world. They have already given that. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not come to give Vaidhi Bhakti. Bhakti which is mm, more influenced by Vaidhi, rules and regulations. He did not come to give that. What did he come to give? He came to give Rag Mark Bhakti. Rag means deep loving attachment in the heart. Rag Mark. For Krishna, there is a category of his devotees who are called Rag Atmik. They have this. Their whole being is completely permeated. Completely. Just like as if you take a piece of cloth and you put it into a bucket of brightly colored dye, colored dye, and you take it out and it's completely 
all the fibers, it's completely absorbed that, you know. It is not going to come out anymore. So the same way, this rag of the eternal associates of Krishna, they are actually called rag atmika. That means their atma is completely rag for Krishna. They know nothing else but Him. And that praying manifests in different rasas in the world. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has come only to give the highest praying. Because he is the Mahavadanya avatar. He is the greatest, most munificent avatar that has ever appeared in the universe, any universe. Mahavadanya. Vadanya means uh, generosity, magnanimity, magnanimous. So he is the greatest giver. It is one of his pastimes because he is the supreme. So therefore, in a particular incarnation, he comes as the supreme giver. Uh, you cannot say that he cannot do this. He gives to the most unqualified and he gives them the highest thing. That is the astonishment of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy. And Krishna has also written that, my dear, uh, my dear philosopher and scholar, if you are indeed interested in the logic and argument, because they like that, Gyanis, they like logic and arguments in discussing them. So if you're really interested in this, then I advise you, apply that logic and argument to the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what will happen to you? You will become completely astonished. If you want to really comprehend what is this merciful giver and what he has given, then just apply it. Apply that same intelligence and logic and argument. Apply that to studying the subject matter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which means his entire pastimes and his life and his teachings and everything. Apply your intelligence there and you will become astonished. Completely astonished. So, uh, Srila Prabhupada, when he was writing in the teachings of Lord Chaitanya about this, then he said, actually, <coughs> there's only one disqualification for someone to receive Mahaprabhu's mercy. Anyone is eligible except for one. Imagine this. All living entities, they're all eligible, but there's one that's not eligible to receive his mercy. Who's that? No. A Mayavadi. Those who have become influenced so deeply by the Mayavadi conception, they can't receive Mahaprabhu's mercy. Now we know that there are Mayavadis who receive Mahaprabhu's mercy, but what happened to those Mayavadis first? They had to have a very, very heavy change of heart, and it had to happen either by meeting an extremely exalted, powerful Mahabharata Vaishnava who gave mercy to them and who they were seeking mercy from, or Goranga Mahaprabhu himself as the preaching, traveling sannyasi, Bhagavan himself, walking on his lotus feet throughout India, uh, ecstatically singing and dancing and preaching the, the, the Samkirtan, chanting the holy names. And everyone that he met, just to be praying to them. Yesterday he went to Alaranath. Yes. How many went to Alaranath yesterday? Uh, probably they mentioned this fact, that that very location was the place from which Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, for the first time, after taking sannyas, after coming to Jagannath Puri, and then converting 
Sarvabhum Bhattacharya and uh, staying there in Puri for some short period of time, maybe a couple months. Then he went to Alaranath and uh, he was already, uh, the devotees were following him because they knew that now Guranga, our Lord, is going to leave. He's going to leave us here. And he's going touring of South India. Because he already told, I want to go to South India. I'm a sannyasi, now I'm going to travel. They gave him one servant named Krishnadas, Kala, Kala Krishnadas, to carry his Amandalu and his, uh, his cloth and to travel with him. So from that point in Alaranath, now Mahaprabhu uh, was about to begin his journey in the hearts of those four bhaktas who had just, some of them just met him and some of them came from Navadvita. Their hearts were uh, shaking, trembling. How are we going to live without him? Because they knew they cannot follow him. They were not allowed to follow him. So Mahaprabhu, from that point in Alaranath, he began uh, his journey. He began to walk away from them. And as, they, as he walked away from them, he began to sing the names of Krishna. Uh, uh, and he chanted this one very beautiful song with the names of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada, in his Krishna book, included that song on the first pages. And that song is <coughs> Krishna, 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 hey. So Krishna, hey, means oh Krishna, oh Krishna. So the mood of this song, Mahaprabhu, he's going to search for Krishna. He's overwhelmed by the moods of Srimati Radhika in separation mood and he's chanting Krishna, 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 hey! And then again he chants Krishna, 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 hey! And then he chants Krishna, 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 Rakshama. Oh Krishna! Oh Krishna, please protect me, Rakshamam. What is that? Save my life, like Shimati Radhika, when Krishna had left to go to Mathura, and she cried out, Oh, oh my master, oh my lord, now you have gone. I cannot see you anymore, I cannot see you. Please, Raksha, please save me, Pahi, Pahi. Otherwise I'll die in separation from you. Then he sang Rama Raghava Rama Raghava Rama Raghava Pahimam. Pahimam means protect me, save me, save me, deliver me. Deliver me from this ocean of separation mood. This is Mahaprabhu's own composition, this song. And as he went walking away from the bhaktas, Sarabhamba Tacharya and the others, they looked at him as he walked into the distance and then they fell to the ground, fainted, completely devastated. That is Alaranath. Did you hear that yesterday? No. That is the place. And the place of extreme separation as well. Every year when Mahaprabhu lived in Puri, he could not tolerate separation of Jagannath. When he was being bathed, Snanayatra, and then he was uh, going into seclusion after, he couldn't tolerate. So he went to Alaranath. And probably you've heard all the details of how actually that deity form is not Lord Vishnu, it's actually Krishna. In the Ras Lila, when the gopis were coming, and he manifested four arms to try to trick them, because he was waiting for Srimati Radhika. And they were tricked. But Radhika was not tricked. Uh, Krishna couldn't hold his forearm form in front of her. <laughs> so, so my God is the very 
virulent disease that if the conditioned soul's heart becomes infected with this disease, then they become disqualified to receive the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because bhakti cannot take root there. It cannot take root, it cannot grow in a heart that is infected with the Mayabad. And yes, it is a great offense against the Lord. That is why. Because one becomes completely distanced. Aparada. Uh, apa, distanced from aradhana, worship. Uh, and worship means Srimati Radhika. She is the embodiment of all worship. So one cannot get bhakti if there is such aparad. But of all the different aparads, this is the greatest, and it is told in the first chapter of Chaitanya Charitamrita, it is the greatest cheating. Uh, because the second verse of Srimad Bhagavatam is telling about Koitava Dharma, cheating religion. Cheating. Use the word. Vyasadeva. There is no cheating religion in the Srimad Bhagavatam. What is cheating religion? I just read this yesterday. In the purports, Prabhupada says, Dharma Artha Kama Moksha. It's actually cheating religion. Dharma. Huh? Following Varnashram Dharma. Huh? That's the translation. No, that's the, in the purport. But, but, in the, but it's describing also in that same section that the greatest of all cheating is to try to become one with the Supreme Absolute. This is the greatest offense. Uh, you've been trying to become God as the enjoyer, the central enjoyer for millions of lives, and you've been beaten down by Maya for millions of lives, uh, and you should by this time get beaten down into submission that now you're ready to surrender to the Absolute Lord, who is the Master, who is the Supreme, and you're just a tiny, insignificant servant. But if your attitude is so polluted by this perverted tendency to become the Supreme, then uh, you'll have to go back down and learn some more. You can't get bhakti in this life. So Mahaprabhu, uh, even though they're so disqualified, when Mahaprabhu went to um, Varanasi, which is the main headquarters of the Mayavadi sannyasis, and there one when the leader of the Mayavadi sannyasis, Prakashananda Saraswati, who had thousands of disciples, he was there. And when Mahaprabhu came there to Varanasi, uh, after his visit to Sri Mandala, Mahaprabhu had gone to Mandala. And there in Varanasi uh, was um, Tapad Misra, who was living there, who was a resident of Navadvipa, who had been sent there. And so, and uh, Chandra Shekhar Charm also. So there, uh, they were always hearing the criticisms of the Mayavadis toward Mahaprabhu. Oh, look at that. Sentimentalist. He's always singing and dancing. This is all sentimental. Because my body is a very grave. Gyan. Gyan. Vedanta. Uh, very hard. Hard. They do severe austerities. Sannyasi. Control. Senses. All of this very hard. But what is this? He's a sannyasi and he's singing and dancing? This is sentimentalism. And they were poking fun at him that he had entered into Varanasi. They didn't know his identity. <clears throat> so Tapan Mishra uh, approached Mahaprabhu and he said, Oh my Lord, I'm, I'm very heartbroken to hear these criticisms of these my bodies against you. So I beseech you, please, somehow or other, change their attitude, change their mood, give them your mercy. So there was a gathering there was a ga gathering of all these sannyasis, a uh, big, huge pandal or something. And uh, they were all sitting there with Prakashananda Saraswati. And Gauranga Mahaprabhu came there to that place. And there's an entryway where everyone would wash their feet because my bodies and uh, sannyasis generally in Vedic culture, they're always walk without shoes. That was the standard 
thousands, hundreds of years ago at that time. There were no <coughs> broken pieces of glass and, and uh, sharp things. You know, they could go barefoot everywhere. So there was a place for washing their feet. And uh, when Mahaprabhu came into the assembly after washing his feet, he sat down just there in that very place, which is considered very unclean. And a sannyasi is supposed to be very, very clean, you see. And bathing three times a day and chanting mantras and internal, external cleanliness, everything. But yet he sat there. And uh, the sannyasis, uh, they could see this other sannyasi who's entered in and he's sitting there. But when they saw him, Mahaprabhu expanded his transcendental opulence, uh, his effulgence, because they're always meditating upon the Brahman, the, the effulgence, the light. Mahaprabhu showed them how this effulgence is coming from his body. And then they became somewhat awestruck. Who is this person? This person that we're talking about being a sentimentalist and all of that. Now he's come to our assembly and now we see. So now Prakashananda, the leader, got up from his seat and came over. And he addressed him. He said, you know, they always address one another as Om Namo Narayana. I offer my obeisances to Narayana because you are Narayan. This is sannyasis. And so Mahaprabhu was showing very great, great humility. Uh, great humility. And uh, when Prakashananda addressed him in that way, but he was showing very great respect to him because they had just seen this phenomenon of his effulgence. So he said, why are you sitting here in this dirty place? Come, please come and enter within our assembly. And uh, we have heard that you are in our sampradaya. Uh, you have taken sannyas from Keshava Bharati. Uh, so you should sit amongst us like this. And we are discussing Vedanta and all of this. And uh, their hearts actually began to change just by seeing Mahaprabhu. And then Mahaprabhu expressed to them that actually my Guru Maharaj, Ishwara Puripad, he, he told me that I am nothing but a fool. So therefore I should not try to study Vedanta. Uh, you are a fool. Don't try to study Vedanta. Just chant the holy names of Krishna. And he gave him the mantra initiation. But then when I chanted this mantra, this Krishna mantra, so many changes came in my body. I became overwhelmed by transcendental ecstatic <coughs> symptoms and I was wondering, what is happening to me? Am I going completely mad and insane? <laughs> then I approached my guru and I asked him, what kind of mantra have you given me? I, this is happening to me. And then my guru Maharaj told me, oh, I am very pleased. I am very pleased. You are now receiving the full uh, ultimate benefit of this mantra. I am very pleased you are attaining love of Godhead. You are attaining praying. So then a conversation ensued in which uh, they questioned him, why are you always singing and dancing? This is not the behavior of sannyasi. Sannyasi is not supposed to study Vedanta. And then Mahaprabhu began to expound what is actually Vedanta and how ultimately Vedanta means the end of all knowledge. Uh, and Sri Krishna has told in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which my bodies don't always accept, but it is actually Shruti, uh, just like the original Vedas, because it comes from the mouth of the Supreme Lord Himself. So there he told, Vedaisya Sarvari Aham Eva Vedya. It is me who have the goal of studying the Vedanta. They, and all the Vedas, all the Vedas, it is me, it is I who am to be known. 
Vedanta Grid. I am the compiler of the Vedanta. I came as Vyasadev. And I am the author of the Vedanta. And Vedavid. I am the knower of the Vedas. All knowledge, I am the knower. So Mahaprabhu took the opportunity to deliver all those mind body sannyasis. There's a whole discussion in Chaitanya Charitamrita of Mahaprabhu preached to them. And at the end, they all became converted. Astonishing. It's not easy to convert such my bodies, especially their leader. But Mahaprabhu completely changed, converted, transformed their hearts. And then at that time, in his presence, they, they uh, began some kirtan with Mahaprabhu. All these Mayavadi sannyasis chanting and dancing with Mahaprabhu. And Mahaprabhu gave them pain in their hearts. See? So, this uh, conception of Mayavadi uh, is utterly antagonistic to Bhakti. Uh, and therefore, it is the mission of our Guru Parampara. Uh, all of their mission, a uh, very important part of it, is to clear the jungles of all these misconceptions. Because if Gilles Gurdjieff often used this term, clearing jungles. Because, you know, when you want to build a house, you want to make a homestead, and there's all kinds of jungles and trees and everything, then you have to first of all clear that away. You have to cut that away. So in the same way, our acharyas, they spend a lot of time hmm, clearing jungles. Huh? And in fact, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, hmm, Srila Sridhar Maharaj told that 90% of his time in his preaching mission was spent explaining what is not our goal, what is not the process. Huh? And then 10%, what is training? What is the process? What must we do like this? And when Srila Prabhupada came to the Western countries by the order of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he also uh, had to spend so much time preaching against the materialistic scientists and the, uh, the so-called yoga practitioners who didn't understand the first thing about yoga. And, uh, and those who have the impression at that time the hippie movement was going on full swing. Yeah? And it was the time when uh, various uh, powerful hallucinogenic intoxicants were being proliferated everywhere. And uh, people are consuming these daily and their minds are becoming completely deranged. And sometimes they would come into an assembly where Prabhupada was preaching and they'd start to declare, I am God! I am God! And Prabhupada would have to deal with this again and again. Sometimes he would, he, he would examine the, the condition of that person and sometimes very, very compassionately he would deal with it. But then sometimes he would also become very strong and say, You are not God. You are a dog. <laughs> So Prabhupada, he knew how to help the conditioned souls, but he had to clear away the jungles and he had to, you know, cure the diseases that were in their hearts so that he could implant the Mahamantra, that he could implant bhakti into their hearts. That's why he composed this mantra for his disciples to meditate upon him. His pranam mantra, Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesh Shunyana Pashnacha Deshataya. He wanted his disciples to know that this is his mission to preach the message of Gora, uh, preach Mahaprabhu's entire message, top to bottom, the whole philosophy of Goranga Mahaprabhu, and in so doing, to deliver all the Western countries uh, who are completely in the grip of this impersonalism and the voidism. Mm -hmm. So it is also very clear today how much they are in the grip. Uh, but most people, most conditioned souls, 
they are not evil and demonic because my bodhisattvas actually makes the soul demonic. So because of that, they have to take birth as trees. <laughs> Ramananda Roy actually told this to Mahaprabhu. At the end of the Ramananda Roy Sambha, he asked various questions to Ramananda Roy. And he said, what becomes of those impersonalist mind bodies? And then Ramananda Roy said, they have to become trees. They'll have to go down and become in their trees. Their desire is becoming fulfilled. Their consciousness completely covered. And now they just stand there for thousands of years, even. Yes. So, so the preaching mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, and his representatives, it is the most powerful mission in the universe. <laughs> And Mahaprabhu has predicted that this mission will go to every single town and village. It will happen. On the, on the surface of this planet, it will go to every town and village, Mahaprabhu said. Priti Vite Yacha Nagara Nagara means uh, village. Nagara <coughs> Gram means village and Nagara means town, city, like that. And he said, Sarvatra uh, Prachar Hoyvi or now. Everywhere will be the preaching of my name. Sarvatra Prachar. Everywhere my name will be preached. Everyone will know me. So, when we came into this Krishna consciousness movement, you know, Prabhupada came 50 years ago, then we were introduced to this. Then, gradually, we began to become aware of what this is. At first, we didn't quite, you know, have the full picture. But once we began to grasp, what is this movement? What is this? Who is Krishna? What is the Bhagavad Gita? Who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Who is... Who is uh, mm. Shiva Vyasadeva? Who are all these incarnations of the Supreme Lord? And, and who, are, who is our Guru Parampara? All these personalities. What is this incredible knowledge? What is the Srimad Bhagavatam? As we became more and more aware of this, we became more and more astonished. How is this possible? How is this possible that I, a tiny, unqualified Kali Yuga Jiva, born in Mlecha Yavana Desh, uh, and that culture and so forth, that I could come to this? How is that possible? Only one way. What is that? Mercy. Mercy of who? Mercy of the pure devotee. Without his mercy, he can take one step toward the Absolute Lord without the mercy of the pure devotee. Mm -hmm. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mercy, as he distributed it himself while he was present 500 years ago on this planet, and he distributed praying, that same exact distribution is still going on now through his agents. His agents, in one sense, are not different than him. Just as a viceroy uh, represents the king or the queen, they have all the same powers as the king when they go, an ambassador to another foreign country, they have the same powers as the king does. They're treated with the same respect as the king is treated. In the same way, uh, the Supreme Absolute Lord who manifests himself within this material world in the form of Sri Guru, the perfected pure devotee, uh, who is distributing his mercy within this world. He is his direct agent. Direct. Uh, sometimes the terminology was used, I remember when I first joined the movement, that the spiritual master is the transparent via media. 
transparent being here. Because he's transparent. Right? He has no other no other issues, no other motivations, only to deliver the conditioned souls, to deliver the message of Krishna to them, to engage them in Krishna's service. So he's transparent, but he is the via media. Without him, you will never be able to approach the Lord. So the pure devotees, they comprehend. They, they have entered into the deepest divine relationship with their spiritual master. This is the symptom of every pure devotee. You will not find an eternal pure devotee who does not have this bond, this deep bond of affection, complete absolute surrender to their own spiritual master. And I have witnessed that, I can say, in each one of my rules, to the ultimate degree. Uh, they're completely, their heart and soul, completely in love, eternal love, eternal service to the lotus feet of their worshipable master. They feel that they owe everything to their spiritual master. So when we can develop this mood, Vishram Bena Gurur Seva, very intimate mood of service to Sri Guru. Vishram Bhav, that my Guru Dev, he is more dear to me than any other person, more dear to me than any other so-called family member of this material world, who we always place so much affection into, our offspring, our husband, our wife, our mother, our father, all of this. Huh? This is called Lokik Sambandhubat. Sambandhubat means very intimate friendship. And Lokik means like in the ordinary material world, how everybody has this very free and easy intimate relationship with their blood relations and so forth, right? Lokik. But when one has that with Sri Guru, that my Guru Dev, he is more to me than anyone. When one can develop that, then real body can come into the heart. When absolute surrender to that personality and loving divine service to him, 24 hours a day, I am living in this world to carry out the instructions and the orders of my spiritual master. Uh, when one is fully surrendered to that, then real pure bhakti can come, uttama bhakti can come, otherwise not. How does one develop that when cultivate that? That's a big question. <laughs> there are many literatures how to develop it. First of all, you have to surrender. Krishna tells us the process in the Bhagavad Gita. There are three things that must be done. First one, Prani Pat. You have to approach that personality and you have to actually submit yourself in surrender at his feet. So that surrender, what does it mean? Does it mean that you just speak, now I'm surrendering to you? No. It means that you genuinely live the life of a disciple. And no one can be a disciple unless they're disciplined. Right? So the spiritual master gives us the criterion of discipline. Hmm? You should follow such and such rules and regulations in your life. You should follow such and such practices. Hmm? That's that very process I told the other day, that it is really encapsulated in the book Sri Upadesha Amrita, the essence of all instructions. So thorough reading and application of that will show you what it means to actually become a disciple and to adopt the path of Bhakti Yoga. So first one has to inquire, I mean, uh, surrender. The second thing is called Pariprashna. And Pariprashna means that we should inquire submissively. The word submissive has to be part of this inquiry. If there's not submissive inquiry, in other words, if it's just kind of casual, like, oh, uh, I'd like to ask a question to Gurudev. 
Huh? Because then everybody will look at me and they'll see, see, he's so important, he's asking a question every day. I mean, I'm not saying that everybody's doing like that, but even that comes up. The ego. Oh, see, I can ask questions to prove Or many other misconceptions. And, and also hearing. There are many different types. There's a whole class that is given on the, <laughs> the uh, false disciples. It's an interesting class. I've never given that class fully. I've heard it a number of times. But, you know, there's different names for different types of disciples. Um, and like one is called what? Okay, let's go over this a little bit. The Baka, the crane. Oh, oh. Sorry. Okay. Uh, anyway, so Paniprasna means that you're you're always eager to hear from Sri Guru, as as we sing in the morning during this kirtan. Nartam Das Thakur has written. That Sri Guru, uh, no, Guru Mukha Padma Vakya Chitete Koriya Aitya. Arna Kori Bhavani Asha. Uh, the mood of the disciple is that the divine message emanating from the lotus mouth of Sri Guru, I want to make my heart one with that. What does it mean? It means that you have to at least follow it. How's your heart going to become one with that unless you follow it? And even though it's not so easy to apply, you have to control your senses, control your mind, follow the process, and then you'll become eligible uh, to actually hear what he's saying. You'll be able to take that message into your heart. And then he says, Arna kori homani asha. In my mind, I have no other hope and wish than this, that my heart can become one with the words of my spiritual master. One with them. So, there's a big, huge difference between an actual disciple and one who is not yet really a disciple, and there's all different gradations. But one can only receive divine knowledge from Sri Guru if these three things are applied. Therefore, Krishna tells this to Arjuna in the Gita. Tavvidi pranipatena, surrender. Pari prashnena. Uh, inquire submissively. Then, Sevaya. Serve Sri Guru. Serve the self realized soul who sees the truth. Tattva Darshina. And when you serve him, how can you really serve him unless you do what he wants? And what does he want? He only wants the best for you. Uh, that's all. He's not there to get something from you for his own benefit. No, he's there to engage you for your benefit in the Supreme Lord's service. So therefore one has to serve Sri Guru. If he gives specific instruction to the disciple, you have to follow that. And if you don't follow it, you're disqualified. Srila Prabhupada told that to the devotees in that marathon, producing the Chaitanya Charitamrita in two months. And when they said it's impossible, Prabhupada said, this is the word in a fool's dictionary. You must do it. Otherwise, you are disqualified as disciples. It was so heavy. Order that he gave. And everybody was frightened also. Yeah. No, we're going to be disqualified. We have to follow this order. So somehow or other, they got together. They discussed, how can we do it? He wants it done in two months. Okay, we got 24 hours in a day. The only way we're going to even dream of doing it is if we fully utilize that 24 hours to the maximum degree. They figured it out. They used their intelligence that Krishna gave. And then they accomplished that. And Prabhupada said, you have my full blessings. So when Guru gives an instruction, the disciple has to follow it. Otherwise, he's a disqualified disciple. And as I said already, there's many gradations. You can talk about that outside of this class if you want to hear about those different gradations of bogus disciples. But anyway, gradually, by failure, it should become the pillar to success. Where none of us are perfect. Okay? Our gurus are perfect, but we are imperfect. So even though we're failing, but we should know that we have to improve. 
And if we don't eventually try to really improve and do what Guru wants, then we're not going to make that much progress in this life. It's a fact. And I can show you a direct quote. I just read it the other day. Where Prabhupada's talking about persons who are in household life, generally they don't make very much advancement, and even their advancement can become nil, even. So, but it's not that householders cannot become advanced, no. But if one becomes a false disciple in household life, and is interested only in sense gratification, and becomes grihamedi, always thinking of enjoyment with the opposite sex, and how, how are you going to develop pure bhakti? So there's, there's a gradient, there's a gradual, and when one comes to a certain age in life, when your body has become old, and maybe you still have some more material desires left, but it's time now to end it. Because you're going to die soon. And if you don't, those samskaras are going to travel with you to the next life. So therefore, even if the material desires are still there, they haven't been yet cleansed fully, you got to now start surrendering. Control your senses. Don't get married again. Don't be with another woman or man. And just live as a disciple, chanting, hearing, being with the Vaishnavas, doing kirtan, relishing and tasting bhakti. Then your heart will become satisfied. But if you want to become fooled again by maya, that that will satisfy you, then go ahead. Because you're going to have to do that in your next life again and again and again. So we've got an opportunity now that is so rare, don't waste the human form of life. Utilize it. And Gurudev always said, so many times, Brother Nath can testify to this, who was with Gurudev more than anyone. He said, if you are already married in married life, and he told me this the first time I came to him, I was in a rehasta life. He says, no harm, but you should be like Shivas Thakur. You should be like Arjun. What does that mean? Be pure devotee in household life. So he said, no harm if you are not married. But if you are not married, don't get married. He would say it with that emphasis. But how many could follow this instruction? They don't follow. And then they even come to Gurdiv. Gurdiv, my wife, wife left me, my husband left me. Now we have a new one. You want to know? Gorky Shordas Babaji? Someone came to him and said, Oh, Babaji Maharaj, I found a Krishna Dasi. Now I'm going to get married to this Krishna Dasi. A nice life shall be. And then he said, Oh, this is very, very good that you have found a Krishna Dasi. Krishna Dasis are so rare. You found a Krishna Dasi? Oh, therefore now you should serve her. You should completely serve this Krishna Dasi. But don't try to enjoy her, because if you try to enjoy her, you'll go to hell, because she's a Krishna Dasi. And then he ran away from her. And there are many, many other stories also. So we have to get the message. Okay. We have to get the message at some point in our life. And if we've been around in Krishna consciousness for 30, 40 years, and okay, it's not, it's not a disqualification to still have some infection in the heart of material desire. Not a disqualification at all. But there's a way that we can deal with that, which we should deal with that. And that is immerse yourself 24 hours a day in kirtan, in harikata, in preaching, in helping the jiva souls. Not to that you can find a new Krishna Dasi helping the jiva souls. No, the jiva souls, to get out of the material world, take responsibility, follow Mahaprabhu's mood. Ama agya guru hoya tara edesh. My order to all, all of you is to become guru, to preach this message of Krishna to everyone that you meet. And then your heart will feel happiness. And even if some little tinge comes here and there, you'll be able to deal with it. But if you go chasing after that, relentlessly giving in to the six eight pushing agents, Vacho Vegam, Manasakrota Vegam, Jiva Vegam, Udara Pasta Vegam, if you give in to them, then 
you won't make much advancement in this life and you'll have to again start again in the next life and you'll carry those samskaras with you, you see. In Kali Yuga are ending now. <laughs> Kali Yuga, very dangerous time. Srila Prabhupada told. Srila Prabhupada told it is a very dangerous time because if you fall down from the Krishna consciousness, he said, it can be many lifetimes again. It's not like you're guaranteed in your very next life that you're going to get Sangha Sangha again. Not unless you fully surrender to Guru, then you're guaranteed. Gurudev said that, you're guaranteed if you surrender. But if you play around with Maya, then it, you may have to go down to the animal species again for some time, and again, wait again for the human form, and again, have a chance. And for those who are not in Bhakti, Prabhupada said, very dangerous time, Kali Yuga, if they've, you know, the, the jivas who are not taking to this process, they can go down for millions of lives again until they get the human form. Imagine, this is a fact. So we're not playing, this is not a game that we've come to Krishna consciousness to join a club. We're here to get pure bhakti. And if we're not getting it in a particular association, we have to find that association from where we can get pure bhakti. This is the message of Srila Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj in his book, Sri Guru and His Grace. So we've made a little tiny attempt to touch upon many of his teachings, many of the teachings of our Guru Parampara and our Guru Dev, and to try to represent uh, what is the actual process that we have to follow in this rare human form of life. So uh, I am now closing this book, Sri Guru and His Grace, and suggesting all of you to pick up a copy of this and read it. Uh, from cover to cover, and then you'll find that actually you need to read it again and again and again, and it will just give you so much happiness and joy within your heart, and it will clarify everything about the Lord Tattva. Gaur Prima Srila Guru Deva Ki Jai, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Srila Padunga Guru Varga Ki Jai, Sri Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Goswami Maharaj Ki Jai, Ananta Godi Vaishnava Vrinda Ki Jai, Sri Gauranga Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Samaveta Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Nitai Gaur Pramanam Ki Jai, Vancha Kaldurasha Vigasana so we want to thank Shubhra Bhakti Vedanta Bhagavan Maharaj for gracing us with this beautiful presentation of Sri Guru and his grace. We have hardly ended this, but it was really, really inspiring to hear about others. <coughs> presentation of the essential directions that we have to follow in order to obtain the grace of Sri Guru and our whole Guru Parampara and also all the Vaishnava. So I really want to say my try to come back again and again whenever we have this type of uh, association gatherings that we can teach and help and share these teachings and help us to obtain the grace of Sri Guru yeah, again and again. So, uh, so much thanks for coming here and please always give your kind worshipful association to follow souls like myself. Thank Brother Nath Prabhu for organizing this wonderful Pure Bhakti Academy in Sri Jagannath Puri Dham. Gaur Prima Nath Prabhu.